Yeah, that's right. Hello, God, dang, hello. God, God dang right. What are these Monday deniers out there? Can I can I say your your hair is looking luxurious, particularly today? I, I, oh, oh, I thought you were talking to Andrew. No? Mine's always luxurious, Brian. Let's be real. <laughs> I've been told uh, I've been told I bear a passing resemblance to young Obi Wan Kenobi. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, that's good. I'd take old Obi Wan Kenobi. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, you know what I'm excited for? A professional show. Oh, Ugh, really excited about just getting professional. <laughs> here we're gonna start weird things here in just a minute. As we wrap. Yeah, Brian. Until that show starts, you're stuck with ours. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I have this thing where like I I fidget when I'm at my desk, but one of the things I do is I like I invent little magic tricks and stuff. Because you can't stop. And so post-it notes have been my thing. So every time I come up with one, now I write it and I put it over there. I came up with a cool one while we were waiting. So. Oh. You are welcome. Excited. Excited. We're doing a Martin Gardner event tomorrow at the Magic Castle. So. Oh, oh nice. nice. Awesome. Yeah. <sighs> okay. Uh, I think I'm good to go for the podcast if you guys are. Yes, yeah. indeed. All right. Say to Andrew in three, two. Hello and welcome to the Weird Things podcast. I'm Andrew Maine, joined by Brian Brushwood. Hello, beautiful people. Justin Robert Young. Hello, friends. And Mr. Bryce Castillo. Oh, that's me. Hi. Hey, uh, everybody. I want you to look up. Just, just, just turn. Just tear, turn towards the skies. What do you think? What do you think? I, I, I think uh, it's windy, and it's supposed to drop 40 degrees over the next 12 hours here in Austin, Texas. Yeah, it's a little chilly. I, I, really, I really need to get this light fixed. It's been out for like a solid month, and I've just turned on more studio lights to compensate. No! I'm talking about Starlink. SpaceX launched another 60 satellites, and actually, like, the first official 60 today. So oh. I, I, I know that we we talked briefly about like the test tweet that uh, uh, Elon Musk was able to send. Uh, I, I, is it functional, functional, or still you know up and coming, or what? Well, you know, Brian, when you first had your property, you could bring an iPhone there and make videos from there. So was it functional? I mean, it definitely was. I mean, we're within sight of that LTE tower over there. Yeah. So. Sure. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're, he was, I mean, yeah, they're able, they worked, but I mean, to, to, they're planning by the end of next year to actually start offering service, commercial service, but they launched 60 satellites today. And, you know, this was, they did the, like the 60 more, I think these were improved the next gen satellites. And this is, I think, start of now the run of the continuous every couple of weeks launching 
these Starlinks in there. What's also cool is they had a booster that had been used like three times. So this was the fourth use for the booster, and they captured it. They used two, uh, well, at least one or maybe two fairings that had been used before. And so that's part of how Starlink is able to save money. And for those of you uh, who maybe knew the show and maybe haven't heard of it, Starlink is SpaceX. SpaceX is Elon Musk's rocket company. That's their plan to blanket the globe in low Earth orbit satellites to provide internet connection. So you'd put a pizza box sized transceiver on your roof and basically have super fast internet just about anywhere in the world. But they want to start with areas that are very, very scarce as far as population, because that's where you know there's a big demand for internet connectivity. And it's kind of easier with satellites because one satellite can cover a lot can cover you know a, a large area if you have a bunch of people like in a big city you know you need more satellites but they're going to move towards that over time very cool so so, so uh, how far off do you think we are from this being I, I i assume there'll be regional rollouts of this uh like like at what point will this start to be i don't know something that 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 the three of us will want to get our hands on <sighs> Well, you know, that's they, they filed for an application to put up like 40,000 satellites eventually. And I think that I think they probably made their business case first with people who were in, in more one, probably for the military and then two, you know, commercial enterprises that are in rural areas or that need that. And then basically to keep adding satellites and eventually get to that kind of coverage. So, you know, there's I don't think they've officially said, like, you know, when somebody living in a city would get it. But. You know, it's going to take several years of, you know, launching these things up there. But they say, you know, in the next years and start commercial service, which kind of cool. Yeah. Well, and I think also the, the, the big money here is going to be with uh, the, the private contractors that are going to be able to get their own, you know, versions of this. So I, I think that's for, for SpaceX, the profitable company. I think this is a gigantic step forward. Yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, I wish it was here now, and you know, I could, you know, get rid of my provider and just, you know, move to this thing. Um, but it takes time, you know, they gotta launch these things sixty at a time. But that's part of what they talk about, you know, Starship, this weird, amazing, fully reusable spacecraft. Part of the business case is, yeah, when we have this thing in there, we're gonna be launching these things like, like, like eight hundred at a time or something just insane, and. You know, and their satellites, it's worth looking at. Go to starlink.com. You can take a look at the satellite itself. It's like this big flat kind of like pizza box that then has the antenna, like one, or excuse me, the, the solar array unfolds from it. They're using the the thrusters that help it maintain and deorbit when they need to. They're like these Krypton ion thrusters and uh, kind of a, just a, a, a different take on it, you know. So the future's now. Very cool. So, yeah. Um, Gentlemen. Yeah. All right. Who did it? Somebody fess up. I mean, uh, I'm not going to say I didn't do it because that's something that somebody who did it would say, but I'm yeah. going to not, not say that. I'm going to mm -hmm. say, uh, I, I didn't do it as long as Brian didn't do it. But if Brian did it, there's a fair chance I also did it, and I may or may not have done it first. All right, you know what? Let, let, let me get, let's get it all out there. I'm yeah. thinking of doing it, but I haven't done it yet, and I mentioned that if I do do it, I ain't going to admit to it, and I'm going to let Justin take the fall for it, whatever it is. So I did it, but I wouldn't tell you if I did do it, Unless I didn't do it, in that case, I'm just giving you a little smoke screen, despite the fact that I'm just saying right now, I'm almost positive that Brian did do it, unless it's awesome. In that case, I did do it, and I did it first. Let me be clear. I did not do it, but if it was done and it was rad, then I'm the type of person who might have done it, but denied having done it because he's too yeah. humble and rad and can handle the fact that he doesn't need credit for every single thing he did when it's awesome. But if it wasn't awesome, then that's not the type of thing that I would have done. And so, of course, I'm going to deny having done it. But unless that made me a martyr... It, in a good way, then I'll yeah. take the fall for having done it. Uh, what, sorry, what is it? I think Bryce did it. I think that's what you guys are telling me. <laughs> <Bryce did it. laughs> 
So uh, I'm talking about who stole Wizard Rock. What? And I don't mean like who stole the sound Wizard Rock, like Harry and the Potters or whatever. I'm talking about the actual rock called Wizard Rock in Arizona, right? This one-ton rock by Highway 89. It went missing. It just vanished. People are like, who stole Wizard Rock? And here, let me describe this. This one ton uh, described as a beautiful black boulder with white quartz running through it. Um, the one ton boulder is believed to have been removed by someone using heavy equipment, right? So this mysterious Wizard Rock, but it gets more mysterious after this, but it went missing. Mm. So you got a one ton that Wizard Rock, rock was huh? like a type of sound. That 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 somebody overheard in 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 uh, Liverpool or whatever. No, that that's that's what they like. Harry Potter fan fan you know uh, fan music is called. Yeah, yeah, Wizard Rock. Yeah, Harry and the Potters. That's like what they do. So, so uh, uh, this is a one ton boulder, mm -hmm. all of a sudden mysteriously gone. Well, I'm, I'm saying, I, I'm not taking myself out of contention, but I'm strongly. <laughs> that I didn't, that you can't prove that I did it. But also, if there's anybody who is in the market for a one-ton boulder separately, my DMs are open. <laughs> I would love to believe that Justin is, like, confused in the middle of a, uh, a, a full-on jury trial <laughs> where he's confusing his situation for being, like, on America's Got Talent or something. He's like, uh, I'm not taking myself out of contention. I think I still <laughs> might be in this. He's getting all the press attention. His name is in the news. Yeah. He's like, hey, we found this videotape that totally you know, exonerates you. Like, oh, wait up. Yeah. I've got a podcast series I want to do after this, and <laughs> I can't drop out of the news. Uh, so how would you move a one-ton rock? Like is that even? All right, so that one, that's the picture one of Wizard Rock. Ton right? at a time, Justin. That's how you do it. What's what's like the tonnage of like an average pickup truck? All right, much... hold on. Can, can, can we back all the way up? Who the hell cares about some damn rock? What's so special about this rock? What if that rock was called Earth, Brian? How do you feel now? I I I, 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 I the question stands, sir. <laughs> What's so special like about Got this it. rock you called don't Earth? Like Earth. Uh, so the so size he, of the rock is what's important to you, Brian. Is that what you're saying? I'm asking you. Look, uh, 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 the obligation is on you to explain to me what's so special about this rock. Uh, apparently, it, apparently, a rock of this size could be worth two hundred dollars for the minerals that they contain. Removal of rocks and minerals from natural forests without a permit is illegal, though. All right. Look. Wait, hold on. Wait, wait, wait. You can get two hundred dollars out of that thing. Mm -hmm. All you got to do is 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 uh, get a one ton rock out of the desert. You do have to commit a felony, I believe. So that's easy money, baby. Oh, Brian, oh, God, it's just two hundred dollars. I'll there. buy it. There it is. Two hundred dollars. Oh, is this a confession? Wait, wait, Are you wait, wait, wait. Come up. Hold up here. Wait, Slide. wait, wait, wait. Let's freeze for a moment. The rock is gone, and Brian now has two hundred dollars. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Brian was waving $200 bills in front of us yeah. to buy a rock that was stolen, which, Brian, I'm sorry. Hmm. We need to dust that money for rock prints. <laughs> so so uh, somebody steals a rock for, for just the mineral value? It's not even like a famous rock for, for uh, having... I mean, it's pretty. It's famous now. I mean, it's probably the most famous rock there is now. It's infamous now. It, it... Oh, wait, hold on. I was, uh, I was Googling Wizard Rock, and I was seeing so many uh, responses, but that is indeed for the musical genre based on Harry Potter. <laughs> uh, so, all right, so, so. Uh, ready for the twist? Yeah. It got returned. What? Wizard Rock mysteriously reappeared. <laughs> hold on. So Wizard Rock left. Enough so that, that we saw the, the ad or the we saw the, the television stories about how it left and now it has come back? Yes. What? But, but, and we don't know. Without this, explanation or anything, just suddenly it's it's back. Wizard rocks do what wizard rocks do. 
<laughs> and a I realized wizard, rock wizard Rock never really disappears fast at the hard. wrong time, nor comes back at the wrong time. Yeah. All right. Um, I, I don't want to be one to start spreading malicious rumors, but how sure are we that this was not an inside job? By <laughs> the national force. <laughs> Uh, Wizard Rock was an inside job. I mean, it does oh God, seem God, like God. it does seem like a perennial problem of national parks is getting people interested in coming to visit, and it does <laughs> seem like a bunch of wonderful twenty-somethings might want to come up with a scheme to attract attention. And it seems like having a rock with the awesome name Wizard Rock vanish and then reappearing. Hey, if 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 the if the, if the if the shoe fits, you must acquit that rock. They may be committing a felony in doing that, but I'm waiting now for the really slow video zoom into Wizard Rock where we see written into small print, Epstein didn't kill himself. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, all right, I I don't think that it is necessarily malicious but at a certain point maybe because all right you need special equipment to lift a, a one ton anything right like like this is not just somebody rolls up with their silverado and uh, uh you know you get four friends they pop it in the back and then you go mudding like this is a a operation one that one would assume would come with tire marks out toward where it is and then all of a sudden it's right back. I don't know. This just seems to me like something that somebody picked up a rock that they weren't supposed to. They were maybe they were clearing something. It it goes into the garage for a little bit. And then next thing you know, they're like, oh my God, that was wizard rock. Uh, the police got called. They put the rock back. No harm, no foul. And uh, uh, the, the, the folks who, who picked it up, maybe without realizing what it was, now they're not going to get in trouble. And then at Presumably. some point, like one of the guys leans over to the other and says, Hey man, is that wizard rock? We'll turn it up. <laughs> That's a reference. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, you know, it's not wizard rock, but I'm sure he was just as cool supporting us on Patreon. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty much friends. wizard rock. Let's be real. Yeah. All right. So here's the deal. There's this website called patreon.com slash weird things. And on that website, you can kick us some money and we do this show each and every week for you. But any little bit of support that you uh, give us, if, if you dig the program is greatly appreciated. Just head on over there. Patreon.com slash weird things. So, we had this was sent in. This was something that was sent in and something I'd found. And I realized that we should have talked about this a while ago, uh, but kind of very fascinating. You guys heard of uh, McKamey Manor? No. So you talk, you know, if you do up a list of like extreme haunted houses, you know, look at M-C-K-A-M-E Manor, it starts to pop up and you can find some Reddit forums about this. At first First glance, it sounds like another one of these haunted houses that's issuing out their sort of their own press releases and stuff or faking stuff to make them sound like, oh, it's the most terrifying, scary experience, right? And then you read it and you find out what this is, and then you're like, oh, no, this sounds like legit. Um, and it's not really a haunted house. It is called a survival horror experience. And basically, it's this guy that lives now in, I guess, like Tennessee – and people show up and they sign like a 20 page waiver. And then he just did his fee and his friends just sort of like find ways to torture you. Wait, so, this what? is okay. This is a very complicated emotional place for me because I have certain opinions as an anarcho libertarian. I also have other opinions as, uh, as an artist and a, a free expressionist. Um, I, I I don't know any of the details of all this, but I mean, if it's if you're signing that much paper saying it's okay to do whatever it is you want to do to create this performance experience, that that seems okay? Question mark. I'm gonna regret saying that uh, because I'm gonna find well, out something terrible about it. Well, so at one point, cops uh, were called in because they heard stories of somebody being dragged behind a pickup truck and a woman screaming and they went there 
in the basement, they found this woman who was dirty and disheveled and whatnot. And they're like, ma'am, are you all right? She says, yes, I signed up for this. And they're like, okay, all right, carry on. And every time they go put on one of these uh, experiences, they call the police and say, hey, just so you know, you know, some new idiot showed up for this experience. So you might hear some screams and stuff. And they talk about how it's supposed to be like a 10-hour ordeal, but nobody really gets past the first minute. One guy says, yeah, I showed up. They put me in a straitjacket. They wrapped me in a fence, and they started to dip me upside down into a pool of water. And I'm like, I'm out. <laughs> Just terrifying. Wow. Uh, he, says, he says this is a lot of hypnosis, right? So this is from the Washington Post. Uh, the manor is an interactive experience that relies on mind games to make people believe things that aren't happening. He says people are not really waterboarded, for example, but he uses hypnosis and other mind control techniques to put that thought in their heads. Now, as a uh, magic and magic related gentleman, how how much how much weight is there in that thought? Uh, s- separate, like here's an adjacent thought, like. Part of the reason uh, BDSM is a unique type of sexual foray in that um, normally any kind of money exchanged for sexual gratification is considered prostitution or whatever. But weirdly, BDSM requires that money be changed hands because if you assault somebody, if you hit somebody, whether money is exchanged or not, uh, then that is a crime, but it's only the fact that, that you, you know, have given people money that is evidence that, that no, 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 this is a consensual activity on that. So I wonder, I wonder if this is entering similar territory where it would straight up be illegal, but the mere fact that people are spending money for it uh, helps to uh, indemnify the people committing everything. Well, we didn't get to the compensation, and that's kind of just as equally interesting. And so, so if you sign up for this, the price is to bring a 50-pound bag of dog food, which he then donates to a local animal shelter. Uh, seems responsible. And, and that, that's that? Just that's, a that's, pound bag of dog food? This is, this is, this is, you know, really it's a, it's an animal charitable enterprise, if you think about <laughs> it. <laughs> All right. Um, so it's worth reading up about the it, people who've interviewed this guy. They say he just sounds like kind of just like a scary, frightening kind of guy, but everything appears to be legit. And just, this is a guy that literally, and he and his the actors, you know, hey, this person showed up, so let's let's go do it. Let's let's just give them this experience that's like like hazing. But like to Bryce's question about the whole psychological or the, the hypnosis aspect of it. Hypnosis gets to be is one of those words that you can kind of apply to a lot of things of like, well, you thought it was this, but it was this. You were hypnotized. And if you look back in uh, a lot of the hazing rituals and a lot of the hazing that was done by different groups and stuff, you find a lot of things they would do like you're blindfolded and they make you reach inside of a toilet and it's actually bananas and stuff and things like that that might, you know, you could, you know, very generously describe as, well, we hypnotized you because we set up your expectation and you thought you're going to grab something else, but you didn't. So, so are we on board for this? Do we, do we think this is a fun, consensual, uh, rollicking experience? I, I, one out of three consensual, (laughs) um, I, I have no problem with somebody because, I mean, if we start saying – because if you can back out anytime you want and if you're in theory like not really getting physically damaged, I mean, even that there's a you know some sort of latitude within that, like you know, who are we to say? I mean, cause, you know, do we want to shut down tattoo parlors and, you know, CrossFit? Maybe. Yeah. Right. I mean, now so, that I think about it. I, I do love the fact that you put tattoo parlors and CrossFit like in the same breath as, <laughs> as if there's barely a difference between the two. So I think we, we have kind of two vectors to deal with. Is it legal and is it cool? And I think that we are all on the same side that this is legal. This is not a, a you know, this isn't a saw situation like the, the person is doing their due diligence in terms of 
charging, letting people know exactly what they're going to get. They're cooperating with the authorities. Now, the question then becomes, is it cool? Like, is it this? Because uh, I think the reason why the, the story went viral was because the idea of the super boutique, uh, you know, a, a David Fincher's The Game level haunted house, specifically in that October stretch when haunted houses are all over the place, seems like a really kind of cool idea. But the more you look into this thing, it really just seems like maybe like a lonely guy who wants to feed his dogs and also donate to this dog charity. Yeah. So question. Uh, let's say that we knew somebody who had a large area of property. Okay? Yeah. And and uh, people with, you know, peculiar interests. And we were going to design the weird things experience. Okay. This is actually, I didn't want to tip much of this, but like uh, there's a number of very bizarre things I want to make happen on this property. And there are companies that can build, uh, uh, you know, picture little singular Arduino microchips or whatever with uh, 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 solar panels and, and, and whatever. Uh, I was thinking about creating different zones on the property. Like, for example, imagine one zone where uh, all they do is they charge uh, uh, solar electricity all day. And then at exactly 1243 a.m., just all these chips ask, what are you doing here? And then, and then that's all it is. And then that's that one haunted zone. And then there's another haunted zone where it's like uh, the, you, you have some that are like, like flicker like uh, fireflies. But then at one moment, because they got some kind of mesh network, they all synchronize and just glow all at once. And then that's it. And then it's over, right? Likewise, I want it so that when you walk onto the property, uh, you, you've got a bunch of different um, uh, infrared lenses that, that just sort of guide a, a, a pen light. So the moment you walk on the property, suddenly you have like, you, you hear, choo, 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 <laughs> and suddenly you have just, just a bunch of red dots on your chest. Like there's so much insane stuff just for the sake of being insane that I want to do. I, I think that's all awesome, Brian, but I think for 50 bucks and a trip to Walmart in some of Bryce's extra time, which I'm, he doesn't have, but you could have people could show up like, all right, Bryce, handle it and give them a BB gun and put some plastic goggles on somebody and do like the most dangerous game. And it'd be cool. I, yes to all of that. Like I, 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 there's, there's no bad ideas in brainstorming. I think we've, we've got a business plan. I'm saying it's a very cost effective way to do it. You know, so it's I, like, oh, all right, Bryce, okay. just shoot them. You know, frozen paintballs, things like that. Let's say a year from now. Right. Uh, this will have been a year plus of uh, the, the seven acre Schwood being an operating, a fully operating uh, entity. Uh, yeah. There will have been many guests, you know, staying there but between here and now uh, or, or then and now. Is there room for the seven acre Schwood like haunted walkway, like like the the, the, the tour that you do for the, the most hardcore fans that, you know, it, it's, it's a walk and you do all that stuff. There's, there's all that stuff. And maybe that's permanent. Maybe you just dial it up a little bit more that as you walk in, you have the, the little like elvish whispering that we have at the very beginning. We've always had at the very beginning of uh, the weird things podcast. When we do the wire tree read, like, like Brian, what, what would you imagine in your wildest dreams? What is, the the haunted walk through that woods because by the way it, you, it would not take much for it to get real creepy real fast in those woods okay okay yes a hundred percent maybe i've already been thinking about all this stuff maybe i maybe i have been looking at so uh, we installed these security cameras and so these uh ring security cameras let you know when something motion activates or whatever but it's like i want to capture the, the, the there's a uh, there's a raccoon there's a skunk there's two foxes i want to capture all of them and and just like add scales to them and then just set them free again 
<laughs> I want to. I want. Uh, I I, I want to do a, a a haunted trail thing. Look, I I feel like anything I say after this moment will only take away from the magic to anybody who dares to do the haunted trail. Well, there's there's you know the business side of it is like doing your is an escape room sort of model, you know, and and that might even be a thing where you you let a couple other people come in there and basically pay to do it and run it and you collect a fee from that or something but that could be kind of a neat thing where it's your your i want to say the word adult disneyland but um your nerdy experience thing on a, on a much larger piece of area the idea that you know escape room does not have to physically be a room so Heck yeah yeah i'm all for it still want bryce with like the bb gun and the frozen paintballs just shooting at participants? Shooting people. Like, hey, I mean, I like, that implicates me in a very oh. specific way that the hypnosis guy found a way to avoid. I just feel like, people. oh, I want to do the Schwood gauntlet, you know, like, because there would be like, oh, sounds cool. Like, what? Well, just Bryce on the roof shooting him. Oh, cool. I'll do it. <laughs> I got the t shirt. There are no teams. Like, Royal Tenenbaum on the roof. Fire <laughs> strangers. That's all it takes. Um, and then some yelling, maybe some yelling. Uh, all right, time to yell out our picks. Hey, uh, uh, hey, I got a pick. Uh, wait, wait, you, you, yeah, you go first. Uh, hey, uh, you need a really big IQ to understand and appreciate that Rick and Morty's back. It uh, premiere season four premiere last night. I enjoyed it, and I'm happy that it's back. I. Didn't that watch was last it. night? I thought it was next week. Yeah. Oh wow. Oh. Crazy. Is it good? Was it is it good? Re, re, good. For yeah. Me? No. It's it's uh, uh you know uh, in in classic Rick and Morty fashion there is uh, uh an element of self awareness to it but uh it is just I don't know the thing I just like I really like about Rick and Morty is that it's just really fun science fiction writing and and it's uh it, it has its own tone but it never sacrifices its competence in storytelling and i i just really appreciate it yeah it was a fun it's a good fun episode and just sort of you know good launch to the show and i think also it's it's very much a bit of a meta commentary on the fact that this is the first episode to air since their mega deal that they got with warner so uh there's there's a little bit of uh of you know, the discussion between the characters on exactly what kind of adventures they want to be going on. And yeah, yeah, uh, that's that. I, I think, it, I don't know. It's it just, it's one of those shows where meta commentary can be frustrating at times for me when it's the, when it's the main attraction, but when it's a nice little side dish, ooh, it can be delicious. I uh, have started rereading because of Andrew's enthusiasm, I'm rereading Alchemy right now, and uh, it's great. I liked it the first time, and I'm glad I'm rereading it the second time. And I agree, Andrew, that uh, 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 Rory Sutherland's performance of it is exquisite. I, I describe it as Bane-like. As as oh Bane <laughs> Bane. Yeah, play play. Uh, because that's actually is my pick this week is Alchemy too. Bryce, do you want to play a little audio for? He's got a great voice, but it, he sounded like he first started. Oh, here's the, you know, his, 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 you know, Bane-like voice. Let's see if we hear it. That are worthy of experimental testing, but never expect them to be immediately popular or easy to sell, even if they're proven to work. If you would like an easy life, never come up with a solution to a problem that is drawn from a field of expertise Simply other be born than that into from it. which it is assumed yeah. the solution will arise. <laughs> Your wish Three years ago, dead. my colleagues produced an extraordinary intervention to reduce crime. They hypothesized that the presence of the metal shutters that shops in crime-ridden areas cover their windows with at night may, in fact, increase the incidence of crime. It's great. It's a great book. Is that even how British people say proven? They say proven? Yep. Or is that just an... an I, I don't think I've ever heard proven. It sounds like, like uh, the, those dudes in American movie with Coven. Coven, Justin. No, it's Coven. Oh, Coven. <laughs> Uh, I got a pick. Uh, yeah, I got a pick. Uh, so over the weekend, a new video game came out, and it's uh, a divisive sort of game. Not controversial, I don't think, but it, it's divisive on, on what people think about it. It is the new game from Hideo Kojima, who made the Metal Gear Solid series. 
uh, and it's called Death Stranding, and it's a very weird game. You play as a as a as a courier, basically. You uh, you you uh, go and deliver packages for people in this post-apocalypse uh, hellscape, and it's really interesting. I think it it reminds me a lot. Do you guys remember, um, or if you heard about No Man's Sky? A few oh, years sure. Ago? Mm-hmm. Um, I, f- I feel like I'm having the same experience with Death Stranding that I did with No Man's Sky when it came out. And I think a lot of people are having that in the same, for good or for ill. Because I think a lot of people expected <coughs> No Man's Sky to be one thing, and it ended up being this other thing that took it many years to kind of get to. Um, but I, I think it's really uh, meditative. I think it's, it, it can be really con- contemplative because you are just one person going through this barren, empty uh, you know, wasteland of America, basically, and delivering packages and 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 trying to. There, there's a whole story bit. We've I've been playing it on the Twitch stream, the Twitch channel here, Twitch.tv/nightattack. Um, but uh, it's I I think just as a as a game, as a routine thing beyond the story and the characters and the you know the characters are 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 are, are neat and the story is is fascinating. The world set, setting of of uh, People dying is incredibly dangerous. Uh, is 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 really cool, um, but just as a as a thing to play, I, I I really enjoy it. As in the same way I like clicker games, right? It's just it's very it's a process, you know. Um, I, I I recommend it, but I also think it's going to be not for everybody. Is it is it safe to say? And this is from outside mm-hmm. of the video game community that Hideo Kojima is kind of the like uh, almost as a like a Scorsese or a Tarantino like just a, a singular sort of like storytelling force in a way that I can't think like as I know Hideo Kojima's name because all my friends talk about it and they've been into this game and even though there's a million other gigantic titles that come out that people get obsessed with I don't know a name in the way that yeah. I know Hideo Kojima's name is that is that safe to say? Yeah, I mean, I think he's maybe uh, uh, like a good second place would be like David Cage of someone who is a creator who stands side by side with his games as as a personality that is known, um, and and as someone who's like because Hideo Kojima really loves cinema, and there there's 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 some written bits inside the game of of like. You know, I used to play this old game, and it was it was about a guy, like very self-referential and and kind of hyping yeah. itself up. But um, you know, he he is someone who is 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 I don't know holds a lot of the story in his own hands, and and yeah, I, I think I maybe Peter Molyneux back in the day would have been a similar sort of persona um, of someone who is is really got his hands in the entire yes, yeah that's that's the weird the weird thing is is that like you the, I'm, I'm sure that within you know gaming like those names resonate but uh certainly in terms of the the breakout into pop culture and the the fact that there just is there's a buzz around him and the game that is unique in terms of the cult of personality for a game creator. Now, normally it's like studios or people like that, that are like, you know, franchises that continue to turn out games, but the pieces inside of them are probably just powerful and potent, but they can be replaced or are replaced at a certain frequency, but not so with the Deo Kojima for whatever reason, like that, that was a gigantic thing. And I just, it was continually like different, uh, you know, celebrities saying, Oh, I'm available with this or people, tweeting back and forth with them in the way that I don't know I can remember seeing another celebrity inside video games. And, like, celebrity is a big part of it. I mean, I think the last time there was a big celebrity involved in a video game would have been, uh, uh, I guess, uh, one of those David Cage games like Detroit or um, Beyond Two Souls that had Ellen Page in it. Um, this has a huge cast of celebrities. Norman Reedus is the main character. Uh, Guillermo del Toro has been body scanned, and so you see his body. He's got they got a different voice actor. Uh, Nicholas Winding Refn, the director of Drive, uh, is a body scan. Uh, uh, Lindsay Wagner, the Bionic Woman, is a body scan, and she voices a character. Um, uh, 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 Jeff Keighley, who is big a big gaming personality. Conan O'Brien had a big segment on his show a few months back about being put into the game. There's uh, it is. 
uh, it's it, and all of that draws attention into this game, whereas I don't think it's a mainstream game for that much mainstream attention. And so I think yeah. it is becoming a really weird event, a cultural sort of event. Death Stranding is, but I really dig it. I think it's a lot of people are not going to like it. I think it's crazy and weird, um, and a lot of people are not going to like mm -hmm. that. Uh, but I I really dig this game. It sounds interesting. Yeah. I mean, I, I in, in my head, I keep thinking of, about the movie The Postman, which and the book, which mm -hmm. which I love that premise of after you have an apocalypse, how do you what what do you connect? And the idea of the courier, the person who yeah. is the bridge between these things, sounds like an interesting starting point or something. So, and that's very that's the cool. short short version of the story, right? Is yeah. America is fractured and destroyed by this ghostly nuclear event, and you're literally crossing the country to connect people who are living in underground cities together so that the internet can be turned on. Um, and also the internet runs uh, via heaven, but it's not called heaven. It's called the beach. Uh, and uh, everyone's hologram now. So hmm. Works for me. Uh, I will, Alchemy was going to be my pick because I've really been enjoying it. That was a great recommendation from Brian. And it took me first to sort of get into <clears throat> understanding kind of Sutherland's way of sort of describing a thing. Cause you talk about like, you know, like, uh, you know, like how, you know, kind of arguing against logic, but understanding when he gets to the point, it's not that logic is flawed. It's that what people put in there as facts are flawed and stuff like that. And once I wrapped my head around, like what he's really saying, I I'm thoroughly enjoying it thoroughly, thoroughly and, you know, cause he'll take a chapter to sort of describe something where he could have said things that are counterintuitive, but it's his way of telling it, so I enjoyed it. I've been enjoying it very much so. And uh, Mike, would you agree with that, Brian? Or oh, a hundred percent. And and he indulges in my favorite of audiobook tropes, which is that breaking of the fourth wall, where he gets to you know, the script says, and now look at this graph, and then just suddenly. <laughs> They are just speaking honestly. They're like, yeah, this doesn't really work in an audiobook. Uh, I don't know, picture <laughs> a graph that kind of looks like this, and there's this thing, and it leads into the other thing, and it's kind of meant to convey blank, 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 and then they go back to reading it. I love that. <laughs> yeah, and it's he's, a, he's the perfect person to do the audiobook narration because he is a storyteller. He is a guy that you can tell is just gifted in that and gets mediums really well. And so I'm often when I hear like an author is narrating their own book. I'm like, eh, it's perfect. So, uh, you know, there's been a lot of criticism of the Terminator franchise and maybe sort of the change in the dynamics of like the focuses of more on like Sarah Connor as opposed to John Connor, et cetera. But like, I, I'm gonna have to double down and say that I'm 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 a big fan of that shift and that change in dynamic, and I am gonna recommend the Sarah Connor Chronicles. <laughs> yeah, I went back and started watching them again because, like, uh, I'm not gonna speak to any specific Terminator in general movie after T2, but let's say I've been monstrously, hugely disappointed by what's happened with every sort of effort to that. And the only thing that I ever really thought, I kind of, I kind of started to sort of dug T3 for some of the elements in a way, but the Sarah Connor Chronicles was one of these shows I've, this is like the third time I've gone through to watch it. Like, you know, for compact storytelling, I enjoy it. So isn't, all right, you take exactly that cast, right? And those scripts and you announce it today and let's say they're going to reshoot it, right? So maybe it gets a little bit more of a budget but it's going to be on HBO Max or Disney Plus or Netflix or something like that. I mean, I feel like it's a big deal, right? <laughs> like, if we could undo the release of the latest Terminator film, yes. Yeah. I mean, but yeah. even if we're like, 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 all right. I mean, obviously, uh, uh, you know, what's her name? Lena? Hetty. Hetty. You know, she did this before she did Cersei. Yeah. Uh, um, which is really the only good thing that came out of Terminator getting canceled was that she was free to do Game of Thrones. Uh, but beyond that, it's like, you know, you pl plug her back into that role. I think it's it's fine. Right. <laughs> like She's yeah. a great Sarah Connor. I don't think she becomes less of a great Sarah Connor for being 10 years older. It's great, yeah. and uh, they, they do, I, I don't know how non-spoilery we want to be, but they, they pull a bit of a storytelling 
uh, surprise in the very first episode that that made it for me. I mean, it was it was like mm-hmm. the, like ballsy and it lands and they're they, they're crushing it. Yeah, there was like there's things you've heard people like, oh, we're going to go do this. And I'm like, well, that was done before. And that was really cool then. And this isn't some of the, the, the new ideas that people try to bring into revamping the Terminator kind of like happened there. And I think they did a they did it again. But if you get a chance, Sarah Connor Chronicles, it's not it was not a super big budget show. It was a more compact show in what they did. But the focus was a big emphasis on, you know, you know, John, who's now in high school and his mom on the run. And, and yeah, I thought, you know, I thought it was great. So I, I've been enjoying it. So that's my pick. Yeah. You know, I, I think the, the thing that that show got that I, has been missing out of every Terminator film since is that it highlighted the idea that this is a chase movie and you're trying to put together this, like some mysteries you can solve and others you can't. Right. Like, but the, the big philosophical things are kind of there. Uh, But ultimately, it's about getting from point A to point B and surviving and not necessarily in the background is all the science fiction, uh, you know, time travel like kind of stuff. But those are all ingredients to set up a very human, terrifying conflict. Uh, and, And all the movies, I feel like, have kind of been awash far more in the fact that, oh, no, this like might as well be in space and it might as well have. Be back to the future where they're going, you know, uh, back and forth all the time because that's really what matters. Uh, all the all the mythology, not necessarily the 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 kind of visceral terror that the best Terminator stories are all about. And so the 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 writer and the showrunner of it was Josh Friedman, which is sort of the interesting thing. There is he was actually brought into the writers' room of Terminator Dark Fate, which among like a million other people, he is a co-writer of Avatar Two. And so clearly Cameron probably liked what he was doing there. And then uh, he has coming out, he is the creator of the Snowpiercer TV series and the Foundation series for Apple. So I'm I'm just, just thrilled that, you know, that Friedman is going to be doing some more cool stuff. So that's really cool. Yeah. But, you know, I wish, you know, that show was had another chance. So anyhow. It's been weird. Hmm. Hey. All righty. Right. Un momento. Yeah. Uh, I'm ready to go and take a break if you need it. Get a drink. Yeah. How you guys doing? Oh, Dude. you know, uh, just hanging out. I got paid to watch a concert over the weekend. That was cool. How was that? Did you did you do two days on that? Or was the, was the Twitch thing? It's, no, three hours a day wow. for two days but uh it was i can now legally add hip-hop influencer to my linkedin if i had a linkedin uh, <laughs> were, were but, you streaming when uh, th- something happened with drake right were you streaming during the I drake did stuff not. Oh, so uh, I, although i did i did dig into it uh so the, the long and the short of it is this uh this is the eighth year for this uh, specific music festival uh the flog Gnaw music festival it's put on by Tyler, the creator. He uh, had a, uh, uh, you know, he was going to headline the first night, Saturday. And then there was a mystery headliner that would headline the second night, Sunday. Hmm. Now, because Tyler, the creator and Frank Ocean have had a long collaborative relationship and, and Frank Ocean had just started to release new music, uh, there was apparently amongst the attendees a very high confidence that the mystery headliner would be Frank Ocean. If not, possibly, again, because they're they're close, it would be Kanye or, or something like that, right? Yeah. So either Kanye or Frank Ocean were the, uh, <laughs> were the, uh, uh, the, the, the special guests. Instead, yeah. it was a collection of ASAP Rocky, Little Uzi Vert, and Drake, but Drake was apparently just doing like old album cut songs that like Tyler, the creator, like asked him to do. Hmm. So it wasn't a lot of the hits and it wasn't a lot of new stuff. It was like older stuff that he very, very rarely performs uh, to which he got booed off the stage because the crowd was so upset you know, that he was not Frank Ocean. I'm going to tell you. Oh, please. 
Like I said, I'm here for you tonight. If you want to keep going, no. I will keep going tonight. What's up? Frank. If you want to keep going, I will keep going tonight. Oh, He's going to stay. It's been love. I love y'all. I go by the name of Drake. Thank you for having me. And so part of it also was that he was like the last special guest in that set, right? People didn't know there was no one else after him. Yeah, I think there was, still was this hope that Frank Ocean would come out and perform after him. Mm. That was not the case. They booed off Drake, and then they got the thanks for coming, uh, please clean up after yourself graphic, and then everybody <laughs> uh, shuffled on off. But wow. yeah, really, uh, you know, I mean, Weird it's stuff. it's funny on one level, but on the other, it's like, eh, that's just really poor, poor, poor behavior. Although there probably could have been a better job in messaging by... Uh, by the, the concert if you know that somebody that is heavily rumored is not going to be the person you can there's ways that you can damp some of that you can yeah. you can diffuse that uh the uh, that incoming bomb set expectations yeah. yeah yeah you can you can have somebody take themselves out of contention you can have frank ocean say like hey i'm not going to be the special guest so sorry if you're not doing that uh but it'll be somebody else i don't know uh, there's, or you could say, oh, okay, it's rumored to be ASAP Rocky, and then Drake comes out on top of that, and now you're adding to the surprise. But uh, anyway, I was not watching that. I, I got my three hours uh, in <laughs> earlier in the uh, concert, and then uh, and then watched television. Cool. Because I'm old. Righty. Uh, after things. Um, I'm so I'm like, I know that name. I don't recognize that name. I know that name. I don't recognize that name. I'm so out of it. I'm so out of it. Dude, imagine be, having to watch because I was watching earlier in the in the concert. So I'm getting all the names that I don't know on the music festival lineup, like just all the smaller text. Uh, uh, and I'm just like, hey, who wants to sidle up with Captain Washed so he can experience all these new artists to me? <laughs> uh, I'll say this. Uh, rap is rock and roll now. I, I think I saw maybe one set that only had a DJ uh, uh, and, and you know, microphones. Like, other than that, it was all live bands, live instrumentation. Yeah. The, uh, that you know, some of the one with the, with the live drummer, that was great. Juice World was the he's Fallout Boy. Like you know, you watch that and you're like, oh my god, emo never died. It just became uh, a trap music. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, you guys want to do after things? We don't have any. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Well, uh, whenever you're ready, in three, two. Hello and welcome to After Things. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Brian Brushwood. Hello, beautiful people. Justin Robert Young. Yo, what's up, friends? And Mr. Bryce Castillo. Hey, everybody. That's me. So here's what I want to do for this episode. And uh, I want to – people can consider sort of a standalone kind of thing if you're getting to After Things or this, you're going to tell people, like, you should listen to After Things. It could be this episode or it could not be. And what it's going to be is we're going to go around each of us and talk about – because if you want, I'm not going to force anybody to – I'm going to say, hey, I've been involved in, you know, writing books now professionally, not quite 10 years, but several years now. And I would say if I were going to give advice to somebody starting now in this day and age, what I would tell them to do. And then uh, I don't I mean, I can say, Justin, if you want to do podcasting, Brian, if you want to do YouTube, you know, Bryce, if you want to talk a bit about, you know, working within, you know, the sphere of modern post-production, et cetera, too, mm -hmm. that would be, I think, could be helpful because, Everything's changed. Everything's changed since we started and things have evolved since we got there, you know, where we are now. And when I got into it, it's different now. So I'll just start off by saying, like, if you want to be a writer today, my suggestion is this. The thing, the biggest change I think that has happened is the publishers do not have the power they had before. In the heads of many writers, they do. People think they go, oh, I want to write a book, and they think they're ergo, they have to be published. And I'm like, no, write a book, have it professionally edited, have it put out looking professional, but you do not need that in the ecosystem of Amazon, of Apple Books, Google Play, etc. 
the publisher used to solve the problem of getting your book distributed to the places where people would buy it. They would print tons of your copies of your book. They would ship it to bookstores so people could go buy it. Now, more and more people read books on ebook form or listen to them in audio form. And that job of the publisher has changed. That's not what, you know, you don't need a publisher to do that now. And the publisher was the big gatekeeper because they could only put out so many books but you as an independent can do whatever you want. So I would say my advice, if you want to write now is pick a genre, pick, maybe even get a little bit more specific in a genre. If you say, I like Western, but maybe I'm going to focus on like, you know, uh, things that take place during a specific time period, or I like paranormal stories, but I'm going to kind of do a story. I'm going to do my own Frankenstein romance series or something. Pick a genre. And I would encourage you to think about, Continue to do within that genre to build up an audience. Uh, books don't have to be as long as they were before. Take a look there. But self-publishing is the way I would go about it now. I would use software like Scrivener is great for writing. I would say that as far as building up an audience is I, I, I think the thing that worked years ago works well today, too, is if you have somebody who has a good voice, you could release forms of it in podcast form. There's programs like Kindle Unlimited, which allow you to let people who have a subscription to read your book for free, which is a great way to build an audience. Well, I guess what I'm saying is like now it's so much easier to build an audience than it was before, but you have to give up your expectations that people had 10 years ago. Give up the idea of I have to have a publisher and let go of the idea that, oh, I have to have somebody pay for every single copy of the book. You know, like I said, Kindle Unlimited is a program where you can publish your book and then people can read it as many copies or readers read as much as they want digitally. And then you get paid per page out of a fund. So that's another big thing that's developed since then. So that's so, my, my short answer. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, the uh, 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 question, what, what is true today about the journey that you just described that was not true 15 years ago? Like, like, like what, what, is a viable path now that was not a viable path before? Well, I think it comes down to the idea of the indie writer. The indie writer can make as much or more. I think that if you're, I think the same amount of energy that goes into traditional publishing put into self-publishing, I think you will make more as a self-published author. I, I also think, and this is, I watched it happen. The fastest way to become a published author is to be a successful indie author. <laughs> like that's, that is, you know, you, Nothing matters in this world in terms of getting hired for anything than proving you can do it. Proving, and especially in a boom bust field like publishing, which has always been a boom bust field and used to be very shamanistic in its, ah, oh, the people, the, the, the wise people from behind the pearly gates. Now it's easier for them to make their decisions because they can see sales metrics. They can see mm. rankings. They can see reviews. So the idea that you are the hidden gem for which will it be, you know, rise to the top of a pile of manuscripts and then you will be shepherded to fame is a far less likely path than you building up even a, a, a modest sized audience with good reviews. So you are demonstrated to be somebody that is self-motivated can uh, uh, produce something that would be well read. I mean, I guess also that's the other thing. I don't know if when, when I was first working with Andrew, how many of those stories would have even been read by a publisher, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, because there was a very little track record of, of what Andrew had written, but I sure as hell know publishers started reading them because they had to. It became something they needed to do because it was gaining a certain amount of success. So you forced them to read your stuff. I think it, it would have happened way faster than just sending it in and waiting. Well, in the, the I'd say the big paradigm that's changed considerably is from like 15 years ago was that let's say I had a book and my friend said this is a good book 15 years ago. And I wanted to do something with it. At that point, your options were really – Try to get a publisher to publish it, and the odds were going to be against you. Publishers turn down really good books every year. It's not like they find, oh, we found one good book to publish. For every book they publish, there's dozens and dozens or more of books that they would have liked to have, but they couldn't. So that was the hard part about publishing is just, they, just limited capacity. 
either, so if you had that book 15 years ago, there's not much you could do. You could do that. You could do a self-publishing route then, like physically print copies, spend thousands of dollars to do that and try to sell them out of the trunk of your car, which is just does not work. It's not really, I mean, there will be exceptions to that rule, but we'll just assume that it really does not work. And it's not a thing I'd advise to somebody. Now, and even when I started in 2011, your, my way of trying to get the books out there was Justin and I would do serialize them in podcasts. We would offer them for like 99 cents or so, you know, to try to do the really, really cheap pricing on it. And that was the way, or we do free. Those models got pushed away. Like you, it's, you can't really price it 99 cents easily anymore and you can't really do free. But what we have now, and, and this is the program I was talking about, is the Kindle Unlimited program where any author can take their book say, I want to make it available to Kindle Unlimited. And there are millions of people that subscribe to this all-you-can-read ebook service from Amazon. And in there, the discovery process can work wonderfully well because you will get people who will read everything in a genre. They won't pay the four bucks to buy a book, but if it's available for as part of their subscription plan, they will do that. And if the second and third book in there cost money, then often you get people who will jump off and go buy your book, but also it's it's just this wonderful platform, in my opinion, for just you know finding readers. I wanted when we started, I gave away my books for free because I wanted to build an audience. I wasn't trying to cash out on it. And Brian's talked about this, Justin's talked about this is like build your audience, build your value, then figure out how to harvest. And for me it was like, yeah, let me build this audience to do that. And now the biggest change I'd say right now is that you can take that book, push it into the Kindle Unlimited platform and you will see all of a sudden you're getting readers, you're getting reviews, and even you know for you know minimal promotion, minimal promotion because just there's going to be somebody in that category that's going to want to read it. They wouldn't buy it, but they'll read it in that platform. Do, do you think the entire idea of somebody who has a story who has you know written the ultimate all American novel or whatever, and is just looking for the right gatekeeper to bring it to the masses. Is, is that dead? Because I get the impression that publishers in general just want to know what's your platform. How many people can you reach is whatever it is you have good enough that, uh, that, that, that uh, we won't be embarrassed by it. And then that's all they want to hear. Yeah, I, I think that they're still looking for publishers are and they still perform a vital service. And I work with publishers and I've had great experiences, but you know, I, I have a clear understanding of what they can and cannot do and what, what their role is. That they still look for kind of the, the 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 diamonds in the rough or to discover authors that maybe don't have platforms, but most publishers now, most of the times they take a look at they they want to find authors with existing fan bases. They want to find authors that say like, oh yeah, I've got ninety thousand fans on Twitter. I've been self publishing my books and doing this. They want that. And 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 my point I bring I point to authors is like, why do you need the publisher then? You know, if the publisher is a great, I work with a great publisher that that offers things that I can't do and can expand way beyond. I've had other publishers that have come to me and before that I'm like, no, like this this offer for what you're doing like. I will in one email campaign, I will do more than I could sell more of my own book than you can do. And there's nothing you're offering to do to me that I can't do for myself. And that's the case of some publishers. Um, and sometimes if an author, maybe it works out great if you picked, but it is a different model. I mean, it's the, the model. Yeah. Publishers, everybody I talked to now is like, yeah, they want to know what my Twitter following is. They want to know this like this, like, yeah, they want to figure out the safest sort of bet, but it also tells you that that's how little power they have, that they can't take an author who's unknown and push them over, you know, reliably. So, you know, I'd say that that's a big change in the landscape and, and it is frustrating because it, it will make it harder to find, you know, the more obscure and the really talented people because, you know, there, there could be, there are amazing writers out there that just aren't on Twitter, aren't active, don't have any sort of fan base and publishers will be like, nah, we're not going to do this. And those are, could be some of the biggest hits, you know, some of the next big books. So it's a loss. So uh, right. in the spirit of the same question, um, th there is a bit of a sort of an epiphany that we had internally. Uh, the Modern Rogue channel recently crossed over a million subscribers. And looking at the numbers, uh, looking at the numbers, I'm fairly certain that not only are they celebrating 
creators when they hit you know, a hundred thousand subscribers or a million subscribers or whatever. But I'm almost certain that there's a full on like promotion that happens in that moment where the algorithm, no, it's not an individual human being, but I believe that what they're saying is like, ah, well, hello kid. You've been here for one, two, three years. You seem to show up every single week. You deliver on time. You deliver content that 80% of the people tend to stick through 80% of, uh, congratulations, we're going to give you a raise. And of course, we're, we're not going to give you a raise in money, but we, we will give you a raise in terms of you are now a proven, reliable entity. And so we'll give you a raise in attention on uh, on, on that. Uh, there, there was a thing recently, just just to pin, uh, pin this on, because this is rather recent news, people have data mined a little bit of YouTube and found that it, they do have a rather proprietary number that they use to grade channels based on advertiser um, friendliness. And so I would not be surprised if being over these different milestones affects that number as well, um, because that number possibly has something to do with how the algorithm weighs the channel when it's recommending and searching stuff. Yeah, I, I guess uh, the, the big epiphany for me is that there's a temptation when you first start getting into YouTube to believe that if you're good enough, you could be an overnight success. And I think it's important f for everybody to realize that um, time matters as a vector. Like somebody who's very, very good is not as valuable as somebody who's very, very good consistently over three years. Somebody who is very, very good consistently over three years is a more valuable commodity than just somebody who is equally as good. And um, uh, it took me a while to, to figure that out when it came to uh, launching a, a brand new channel with the Modern Rogue. That makes sense. And that, because like it, you would seem that the fear of that algorithm is that you push somebody in at the expense of somebody else. And then all of a sudden they just sort of peter out and you, you directed all those eyeballs over there versus a channel that could become much more advertiser friendly. Yeah. It's one of those but. things where it's like uh, every episode that you put out reflects on us, the brand or the network, you know, that is supporting you. So I, I'm like, Brian, like I want to do kind of a cool retro behind the scenes of movies, YouTube series. Like I want to kind of go back and dig into, I'm just making this up, whatever kind of thing. And I want to do this. I've been taking classes on video production, been working on my speech and, uh, I've been doing this now, you know, I've been, I've been making, I'm like 10 episodes in what advice would you give me? Oh boy. Um, I mean, in general, uh, same, same advice that we've always given, which is, you know, be bad so that you can become good. Uh, give yourself a safe place to be bad. Uh, I, 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 the, the biggest thing is just go. It's better to do than not do. And there's a million very, very good reasons why you should wait and make sure you do it right and you should ignore all of them. So one of the things that I, I guess that, I mean, I guess is that like, Going cross platform and working with other creators is even more valuable now, though. Like, like you know, the more you can be seen in other places, it would seem like that might be a valuable thing to do now for a person. Is like, don't just be in your own silo. Is in in is multiple is doing multiple shows and multiple channel or multiple shows is a better idea now than it was ten years ago. A hundred percent. I mean, I mean, that's quite literally why we're building out the 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 Modern Rogue World headquarters is for the opportunity to make collaborations easier, more affordable and, and, and mm -hmm. simpler. But do you, do you think that scales down though for a single person to be handling multiple channels and multiple shows rather than focusing in on one and, and making that their big, I mean, yeah, we, run, it, we run eight Patreons here, but that's because we have enough people to man all of that stuff. Right. We have right. So, so it, as a matter of fact, it, 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 I believe it does, or I suspect it does, but from the flip side, which is, um, let's say you don't have an infrastructure. What you do is you have your own channel. What you need to do is figure out what's your message. What do you have to say to the world? And then just look at every other channel out there and say, uh, who could benefit? Who could I give essentially free, uh, uh advice to? And, uh, you know, Justin and I went through this with, uh, uh, the twit network 
where it's like uh, we were willing to put forth a lot of time, energy, and effort to put out uh, unique hot takes in the world of tech that they did not have to pay us for. Uh, but we did it because we, were, we had the brief opportunity to hop onto their stage and audition to their audience and hopefully seduce some of them into uh, our comedy program. Um, I think that, you know, it was interesting. There was an article that came out or a study that came out and it was said that like, uh, number one job that American kids want to be is like a YouTube personality. And they're like, the number one job that Chinese kids want is to be an astronaut. On one hand, it was sort of like, Hey, look at these dumb American kids want to be YouTubers. But I'm like, I don't know. Like, I don't, you don't get killed in the United States for being a politically unpopular YouTuber versus <laughs> China. Sounds like, sounds like astronauts, the safer job in China. Um, but also, and, and, and part of it too, is like, we do put so much emphasis on these personalities, people like that, where, you know, Chinese media is going to celebrate people who work for the government and do things that reinforce sort of the state ideals. So I didn't know how much to read into that, but I certainly know that when I, you know, you talk to young people, like, you know, way more of them want to go into the entertainment fields than when I was a kid and way more of them look at this as an out because it's what they watch all day. Because also it's like, uh, to say a YouTube star is, uh, I even think, kind of a definition that we don't really even fully have a handle on. Like, are you guys mm -hmm. aware that one of the biggest boxing pay-per-views of the year was put on on Logan Friday? Paul. Two YouTubers were fighting in the Staples Center, and it got a, it sold out, or a, a, it sold a ton of tickets in the Staples Center in L.A., got a gigantic deal with the same platform that has some of the other top boxers in the world signed to contracts like so when, when you really think of like okay well what is youtube what is new media what is social media uh it really is like in in a world where so many of uh, you know the old platforms are not dead but they are certainly humbled uh you can put together things that are heretofore un unthinkable the the fact that that was Two YouTubers fighting, KSI versus Logan Paul, who, by the way, is yeah two years away from being like banned from Japan for filming a corpse and thought to be kind of like canceled, and 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 that was that. Now, a massive sports celebrity that has garnered like fairly positive press, even so, uh, uh, there is there is just right now a fascinating world of like, no matter what, whatever you thought about new media and I, I think i've had a year's worth of collective conversation with everybody that's on this podcast about what new, what social media is what new media is and we have been kind of consistently wrong with how like you know initially we thought oh it'll just be television it's not it's something very different and we're continuing to see exactly what that means so What's your advice, Justin? Uh, you could either address anything you want, journalism, podcasting. No, I'll do anything. podcasting. Number one, uh, expect to make less money than uh, in either YouTube <laughs> or, or, or publishing because uh, there are fewer direct channels. I mean, obviously, Patreon is, uh, uh, you know, before Patreon, it was very, very hard to make money in podcasting. Uh, now, thankfully, that is there, and those tools will continue to um, – to, to grow. Uh, the, the biggest thing is that unlike YouTube, which at the very least requires you to be multidisciplinary in terms of video and audio uh, and publishing, which is a fairly solitary pursuit and is far more about, you know, you getting uh, uh, the product that you need and figuring out a place to then put that finished product where it is. Podcasting is by its nature, at least, a very personal and a very, uh, you know, the, the audience is very expectant. Uh, and also it leads the easiest and the quickest to people doing, uh, you know, not great versions of it. Not to say that there's not a tremendous host of not great books or, or YouTube, but uh, I think that it's it's easier to make a, a very bad podcast the, the the point i guess i'm trying to get at is man the the if i were to try to make a boot camp for podcasters the first thing that i would want somebody to do is literally take all the ideas they have for a podcast and all the friends they want to do a podcast with and 
and all that and literally just do one episode of each of them. Instead of starting 15 podcasts, do 15 episodes. Literally just understand what that is and and how easy it is to get people to work uh, uh, with you. And how, do you like it? Do you like the uh, end result? What would you do going forward? Because the biggest way that I think people get frustrated with podcasting is you start it and you start to learn a lot of those really important lessons that Brian talks about all the time about finding a good place to be bad. But then because of the nature of the beast, you realize maybe a few, and again, there, there are lessons that you can learn right off the bat. And then there's lessons that you have to be at a certain level to really appreciate. You realize, Oh no, wait, this isn't, this is why I don't have eight people on a show. This is why, um, I, I want to make sure that things are edited in a certain way. This is, this is uh, a value. This is good. This is bad. Like, uh, th that would be the, the number one thing that I would say now is like, just do a bunch, just, just go and make them quick, make them short. The faster that you can learn the idea that brevity is the soul of wit. Oh my God. Like beat yourself up until you realize, keep this stuff as, as, as tight as you possibly can. Nobody ever listened to a 20 minute podcast and said, Oh my God, that was a great 20 minutes. Uh, I wish that it were 40 and have that be a bad thing. That's always a good thing. That means that you people are going to want to listen to your next episode. I, I think uh, you said something really interesting a little earlier that podcast audience are kind of more expectant than yeah. uh, than some of the other audiences, right? Because they they buy in, right? Subscribing to the feed is is uh, a, a certain commitment that can be taken away at any time, and because the landscape of podcasting is still rather light on discoverability. Uh, if you lose someone, you might lose them forever and they will forget about you and they won't check you out again until you are in their face and give them a reason to. And so, yeah, like definitely get started very quickly. You know, make sure you find out what it is you want to do and and get, you know, and, and stick to that core. Uh, but also getting into a headspace of this audience can be very, very can be very like deep rooted, but they also like you're, you're you're asking a lot of time out of them and so stuff like fidelity does does become a sticking point like you they are uh they're they're also as fickle they can be they can be very committed they can also be very fickle and and there's yes. so many podcasts about so many topics that uh that time that it takes you to get good is very important because there are other people out there that they will go to if they want that thing the the other thing is and this is something that I think does, this is kind of a second or third level thing, but it is a good North star to understand because for me, man, it, it really was even in the last year, it, it clarified a lot of philosophical stuff in my head in terms of podcasting, get in touch with your listener, you, the listener, right? Because you, the listener, impatient, selfish, <laughs> angry <laughs> listener, uh, is a great clarifying, uh, blinding truth to the, the the stuff that you are doing, and the and the the less you rely on, oh, but I'm having fun. I'm doing a really great job. I really like this joke. I really like, you know, the fact that we went another thirty minutes. Or like, really, it's about the digressions. It's like, okay, if that is the case, then wonder about yourself, the listener, try to separate you, the creator and you, the listener, because, uh, there, there, there's a lot where, you know, I, I just kind of revamp both of the major podcasts that I do and the politics one in specific, because, uh, I, I just kind of realized that we're about to get an organic wave of new people just checking out politics podcasts. And I, had to face some hard truths about the stuff that I was doing before and, and how that came off and uh, the audience that I want to attract and, and how I can make a good first impression because I certainly have a hardcore audience that, you know, is going to follow even if I change a few things. But uh, 
it was it was clarifying to me. And I've been doing this stuff for over 10 years. Right. Like uh, uh, and, and there's it's 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 difficult. But also, you know, it, 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 all of these things are bound by the idea that they are processes and all that you can ever do is learn a lesson from when you do things wrong and uh, uh, remember and file away how and why something right worked and, and seek to understand that. I That's such a critical point because I think that things you get better at faster are things where you get feedback faster. And, you know, it's hard to become a better writer when you write a book every couple of years and then you don't know was it and you're waiting for if, it, the, if the rejection was because of publishers or it sucked or whatever you know i i made i wrote 10 books in my first year because i i realized with books you put stuff out there people tell you what they like what they don't like you can measure things you can do that we all got into podcasting around the same time but i know my time spent in podcasting is nowhere near the value you guys have spent podcasting because you guys produce so much more and have had so many reps and that's one of the things that made me think about it like sure i got into the same time justin and brian but when i do a show with you guys and i see your guys sense of timing and all these other things that comes from the reps it makes me appreciate like yeah you don't just go well, i've been doing this for 10 years it's like you know you meet trainers in the gym like i've been training for 10 years it's like i don't know if you're a good trainer you know like you've been hmm. maybe but how do i know did it take you six weeks to look like that or six years and so Time spent's not the same as effort. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's, it's a matter of uh, iterations uh, across yeah. the board. Bryce, any thoughts? Uh, from from a production side, um, I, I think a lot of the the general stuff that, that we always talk about, which is like get started, find a way to get started, find a way to make something as soon as you can so that you can keep getting better and better. Uh, make sure that you have a feedback, you know, element to it, so that you are listening to what you're putting out and and trying to put yourself in your viewer or listener or reader's mm -hmm. eyes. Um, uh, but also on on the actual production side, like uh, make sure you're forward thinking about the skills that you're growing. Right? Um, if if you are, uh, let's say, if you're if you're doing videos, right? Uh, I'm sure you can probably get a lot of good. You can you can get some good work out of a out of a GoPro for a while, uh, but but uh, remember to think about like what else can you do to step up? What is what is the next real step to going to a real camera, going to real audio? Uh, when it comes to podcasting, are you uh, are are you just using a, a Yeti Blue USB microphone? Uh, is that all you can afford? Do you know how it works inside and out? And then what's the next step for you? Right? Are you going to have a million USB microphones in your computer? Or are you going to move on to a, a real mixer? Or are you going to move on to uh, to real editing software or, or more proper professional software? Because uh, not only are you creating a thing which you can maybe monetize and maybe build an audience for, you're also building your skills. And you have to make sure that uh, you are constantly thinking about how you can build up your skills in a way that will benefit you in the long run. Uh, when I started doing music, I mean, back in 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 high school, um, I was using. And music's different because uh, it's kind of like writing, where where as long as you get to the end product, there there's not too many uh, too, too many specific ways you have to work. But uh, I know one of the first things that I bought was a real copy of Ableton, which is the software that I use because I, I liked using it. I had been pirating for a while, and I knew that I liked it. And it's it's a very, it's a real sort of professional grade software, and I still use that software to this day. I, I haven't upgraded, but I still use I still use that one. Um, same with video editing, right? Are you are you using Windows Movie Maker? How long are you going to keep using Windows Movie Maker? When can you move up to uh, Premiere or Avid or or Final Cut even, right? Like continue to find the next ways that you can um, y you can build out your skills skills professionally. Uh, because there are just going to be some things you can't do in Movie Maker, right? It's just it's you're just not going to have the same ability to do graphics or little things that you want that you're going to want to do to make your product better. You're not going to be able to because you'll be limited by your tools, which will, you will feel because you're limited by your skills. So continue to expand yourself um, because you're going to want to do more things. You're going to want to do bigger things, and you need to know that when you make the step to doing that 
that you also have the tools and the skills to do that. Uh, it, it, you know, yeah, that 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 is so huge, so huge. Because uh, I know for me, this project that I've been working on, uh, literally, I initially wanted to bring in a professional to uh, organize and edit everything, and then at a certain point, I realized I don't even know what I'm asking for. Like mm, I'm yeah. I'm I'm gonna get sucked into this uh, thing where somebody else's uh, cause if you're actually dealing with a true professional and I was, you know, they're looking to me, I'm the quarterback. I'm the one deciding where everything should go. They're the hands that are going to assemble it in the best way. And there is no way that I could really even know exactly what that was until I did it myself. Let your frustration be your guide mm -hmm. in everything, right? Like right. let your frustration be, that is a guiding your hate for like, oh God, I sound like crap. Ah, this book cover looks like garbage. Oh, this edit, I mean, like, I just don't know why I can't look, you know, like these other people look. Like, it's just so frustrating. Yeah. That is, congratulations. That is the cheat code to life. It is, it is hidden in your hatred of your own product is like, just go drive toward that. And, and I, 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 I don't want to tell everyone that the secret is self-loathing, but I know that watching the early days of Scam School, it was very clear like what needed to be fixed. It's, it's like, would you shut up? Would you get to the point? Would you mm -hmm. skip this? What are you doing? Uh, uh, stop, stop impressing yourself and so on. And if you're finding that you are having a difficult, difficult time being critical of yourself or have a, like, I don't love listening to my own voice. And that's, that's, that's just, it makes it tough for, for me on some of that stuff. Uh, go and ask for help, ask for that feedback and, and ask for, you know, say like, be real with me. Tell me when you are frustrated by this thing, you're not going to hurt my feelings, but let me know the, th the things that I, I, I'm doing that are annoying you because that's, that's I what you need. You need that feedback. And yes. if you can't be it for yourself, then you can definitely, someone else will be it for you. Yeah, that, that self-loathing thing, like, man, like, because, like, in my head, I always have, you know, nobody cares, nobody cares. And, like, and I remember when when I would perform, you know, as a stage performer, in the back of my mind was always, like, they're bored, they're bored, they're bored, you know. And, and so, like, I never tried to be as entertained, you know, by myself as I hope people were being entertained. I always assumed that it wasn't. And... And if I think it's finding that right balance to be to be healthy, um, I, I've twice in the last couple of weeks, uh, my girlfriend's got a film that's out at film festival and we've you'll see periodically. And I've had this twice where we've seen somebody who has been like they make a film and maybe the film's good or maybe it's not so or whatever. And then often, you know, somebody like, how long you've been working on it? And the answer will be like, oh, five years or whatever. And you're like Whew. and they're like, well, I didn't know what I was doing. And I'm like. I, and I was, and I've twice, I've wanted to just raise my hand. I'm like, Hey, maybe a year in take a goddamn lynda.com course, <laughs> you know, like mm -hmm. at what point do you say, maybe I should learn some more about this thing that I'm spending, you know, my time, my money and all this into. And that's, I would say that's it. I don't know why it frustrates me, but I guess it is that a number of times where you talk to people like, yeah, I want to do this. I want to do a podcasting thing. Well, you know, lynda.com, you can take a course or somewhere for free that will teach you the basic. I'm like, nah, I'm just going to go record it and do it. You know, like, oh, I want to go make a movie. Like, okay, I'm I'm a big believer, like throwing your hat over the fence and doing something. But once you decide you want to do it, that, that weird, like the artist sort of, yeah, I don't want to learn the business side. I want somebody else to do this and that, that I don't want to invest anything in myself and improvement attitude drives me nuts. Well, you know, I'll tell you what, I'm, I'm, I, I, I do think that is a second level lesson where some people just need to burn their hand on that stove. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that's why when I, when I was saying like, just do a bunch of one off podcasts, do a, because that you trust me, you're going to find out why an eight person podcast is a bad idea. You're going to find out why you need to get a, a, a better mic or figure out a way that you can maximize the sound off your mic. You're going to figure out uh, uh, that, you know, that it takes time and look, I hated listening to myself. I have to on every, especially with the politics stuff. I have to now. I'm just doing too much on the on on the editing side. I'm not recording as live anymore, and so uh, sometimes I leave things on the timeline that I wasn't supposed to, or the timing's off. And uh, I, when when you think about that again, the frustration. I'm like, ah, 
that's a missed moment. Like if I was able to hit that in rhythm or hit that in beat, then then uh, people would feel like, oh, that's like the mark of professionalism. So it's like I get it. Uh, uh, if you just are like, you know, you're just that kid on Christmas, your dreams right there, you unwrap it and you don't want to read the you don't want to read the instructions. You just want to go play with it. Then go ahead and watch it break in your hands. And but do it as fast as possible. The what the one professional thing I would say is make it a five month thing where you put out something that you're like, oh, this is bad instead of a five year. I, I, I'm all, and I'm all for it. Just do it. Don't 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 hold back and say, well, I got to take this course or do that. I'm like, do it. But then once you realize, like I've I've met people like in the TV industry, like you know who. Who at the start, like, oh, I'm going to go do this thing. Oh, you should take a course on this thing. Like, no, nah, no, nah, I don't have time to go do this. And then three months later, they're showing me a thing. I'm like, yeah, I've been had this problem. I've been trying to solve it for weeks. And, you know, I spent all night doing this. And it's like, yeah, and in two hours into the course you were going to take that I suggested, they would have solved this thing for you. But the stubbornness to say, I don't have time to do this, which manifests itself. And like, I watch it people five years later, you watch like, this thing should not have taken that much time because at some point you got to go, Oh yeah, I guess I gotta learn this. Yeah, yeah. Because so. every every late night you spend googling how to solve a problem, there you, there was probably there probably fifty percent of the time at least there was an answer in some sort of course, right? Yeah, and um, I'm and I'm that, super, that's a learning process, but but still. And I'm I'm super super guilty of this too because I have bad habits in coding and stuff like that. That if I spent more time to learn more advanced techniques, so let me just say that it's like, mm-hmm. I have my own version of where I don't follow my own advice and it's starting to bite me in the ass. Yeah. So I think that 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 that's the 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 broad advice I would give to someone is is you know work, figure out how you can be better at what you want to do here, because there will be more projects beyond this one. And you will want to get better, right? You need to build yeah. good habits and good skills. Well, all right, let's do picks. Uh, Watchmen, it's good. Anyone who says it's not good is a liar. <laughs> and fired. <laughs> no, I don't. I didn't say it was bad. I just said <laughs> I will get back to it. <laughs> did you did tell it to pound sand? And it and should go pound pick, sand until it's done. Did, to do things to your <laughs> well <laughs> uh yeah uh, watchmen hey i started watching glow season three Ooh. uh i really have liked it. i'm like eight episodes in but ashley and i have, have really liked it it's uh it continues to be a compelling show and also you know since i moved out west i've i've spent uh well i guess between magic and and moving out here i've just Spend a lot more time in Vegas, but it is a very fun snapshot of what 80s Vegas, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, was as they take this uh, cult television show and turn it into a regular show at a uh, a, a casino. But uh, there's there's some there's some fun stuff in there, and uh, I I hope it resolves well. You're in season three, did you just say? Season three, yeah. So not season four, which is the newest one, right? No, season three uh, is the new one. Yeah, yeah, season three is the newest one. In Las Vegas? Do you like this? I like it, yeah, so far, yeah. Oh. I know you, you didn't love it, Andrew, right? Because it... it, it I didn't it. finish it. I'm like, wow, I'm like two episodes in, nothing's happened, I'm done. I'm going to go watch something where things happen. Mm-hmm. So not watch them. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I guess I could, I, I could, I could see where... There are there are frustrations that I have with the show in terms of kind of where they want to pin uh, some of the the emotional arcs, uh, but there's there's enough uh, of that of that world that I like being in that I've, uh, I've I, I kept watching. And also, it's like it's thirty minutes, so it's a little less than thirty when you watch it. It's it's fairly painless for a Friday night. Yeah, no, I, I mean, other, yeah, I, I'm sure. I just, for me, it's like, it was one of the things like, the pay, all right, we're going to stop the show here to go have this con- long conversation. It's going to be overly long to get to a point you're already ahead of. And then, all right, now we're going to, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you like it. Yeah. It's, it's an after things pick. It was a nice, it was a nice Friday night with the missus. Yeah. Any other picks? Uh, uh, I got a little pick. Uh, this is out now on the Apple Arcade. It's a game called Guildlings. Um, it looks like it might uh, end up being on PC or some other platforms. 
Uh, this is a neat little sort of adventure game where uh, you uh, are uh, given a cell phone, but this but cell phones are like uh, wizard books, and so <laughs> you you end up being trapped. At, I I I'm, I'm only just scratched the surface on it, but uh, this is this is a very neat little game where you're kind of doing a little bit of puzzle solving, of of trying to traverse these areas with. Um, uh, with your friends as you have inadvertently become a guild uh, master, some sort of wizard person. Uh, and there's a little bit of a fighting turn-based mechanic where, where uh, your, your, your partner's emotions uh, control some of their, the skills and, and, and spells that they can do. The writing is really, is really fun and cute. Um, it's very sort of like, uh, I don't know, very modern uh, you know, uh, text sort of talk. Uh, and it and it looks really great. Uh, it's got this really interesting sort of cell cell shaded look, um, and it, it it's it, it so far has been a really easy play. So uh, if you've got the Apple Arcade, I think Guildlings a new new new. Title. So so if you've already taken the leap into you know doing the Apple Arcade ecosystem, mm. yeah. Uh, what I what I have a hard time with is figuring out like what's the best filtering mechanism to figure out like what I should get into. Um, I mean, just scroll through the page on the App Store. You know, they've got they, they do have them all listed, but you can stay. They've got little um, carousels for like, oh, family stuff, oh, action stuff, oh, puzzly sort of stuff. Um, I'd say take a look at at, at that, um, and then they give you a push notification every week or every other week whenever they add new games. So you can because they're not too too many games at this point, um, and so when they add a few. Um, that, but I, I don't have anything that I check. I on Twitter. I just I saw someone, a games journalist, mention Guildlings and and it's free, so I just did it. I down I end up downloading a bunch of them and a lot of them never even starting, um, uh, you know, never even like opening up the first time. But hmm. uh, yeah, um, uh, my pick is going to be a it's a, a frequent pick here and. My biggest frustration with it is the rather unwieldy title that I can never remember, and I always have to go look it up on Amazon. Um, and that is Scott oh, Adams. What's that? The Bible. Yes. <laughs> Which version? Um, and that's Scott Adams' book, How to Fail at Almost Everything and Still Win Big, kind of the story of my life. And the thing, the biggest takeaway from that book is what we talk about a lot is skill stacking and just – building your skill stack, picking up skills. It doesn't mean you have to go to college. It doesn't mean you have to do anything, but when you can draw a circle and say, I know this thing that has value. And the more things you know that have value, the, the greater your skill stack is, you know, looking at, you know, Justin, Brian and Bryce, these are all people that have different skills that might seem separate in isolation, but when you package them together, Justin's journalism background, you know, Justin's having learned podcasting, Justin's sense of humor and having done sketch comedy and stuff and that, you know, Brian's live performing stuff, but then Brian adapting to doing, you know, uh, your first year, your YouTube shows and podcast, all of these things come together. And that's how you create a talented person, not just one talent, but multiple, you know, you can have a musician that's has a wonderful voice, but if they have no stage presence, you know, and they have maybe, you know, uh, a poor exercise routine, then maybe they're not going to be a person that's going to tour or and we can come up with many examples. But athletes, you know, you break down what makes a great professional athlete isn't just one thing. It is a number of physical skills and mental skills, et cetera. And the shame applies to us. Well, yeah. That's when, uh, one of my favorite takeaways from that book was he talks about how it's better to be instead of being the best plumber, it's better to be a good plumber who can also speak Spanish. Because uh, yep. you'll make much more money that way. Yep, yep, hundred percent. So, gentlemen, it's been after. Hey, look at that! All right, everybody. Hey, we did it. Huzzah! Yep. Uh, Cord Killers is off this week because it's uh, Veterans Day. So we will see you back here tomorrow yeah. for Night Attack. Uh, let's see, uh, Andrew. Any any streams? Any 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 in Important things coming up in the next week for you? Um, no. Cool. No. <laughs> Justin, uh, streams, DTNS? No, not until, uh, well, I mean, DTNS is on Thursday. Now, today, it's just uh, more getting getting stuff done. Nice. We got an next top podcaster, but that's not mine. Yeah. 
Uh, We're going to yell at the yell at a lot of people today. Oh, yeah? Oh, nice. You're going to hear about it later. <laughs> uh, Friday, we'll be back on Death Stranding. That game. That game, man. We'll be back with that on Friday. Brian, anything coming up? I guess the night is uh, out, but... No. Oh, you're busy with other stuff. This drop week. into a gig hole. That's yeah. right. In the classic gig hole. All right. Well, uh, until uh, until uh, have a good gig hole, everybody. We'll see you. Yeah. <laughs> gig that hole, baby. <laughs>